webcasts will be available to stream from the Helix and the faculty websites. So um, without further ado, I will give the floor over to our speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and, and uh, also very pleased to be invited um, to speak. And thank you, uh, Justine, Imogen and, and, and Gia. Um, um, it's great to be here. Um, so um, my intention today is to, um, in about 25, 30 minutes, um, walk you through the, the development of um, um, a digital intervention in the area of reminiscence from the, the research lab to getting it into the app store. Um, and, and then really to have a, a brief discussion about some of the issues, opportunities, um, uh, more questions and answers really in, in a, a small section on, on discussion. So um, um, this is not um, a presentation about um, AI and ethics, it's, it's, I have done those, um, um, and, and I know that uh, uh, the, the, the ethical aspect is very important and underpins everything here, but I'm not here to um, present uh, uh, implications and ethical considerations and, and, and so on. Um, this is very straightforward. This is the kind of data that is generated and, and, and this is what it means. So um, at the start, uh, way back, um, uh, 78 years ago, we got some funding for a, a, a study, quasi-experimental feasibility study um, on the efficacy of uh, re digital reminiscence for people living with dementia in their cares. Um, uh, so that's the first part of the three parts. The second part is then the development of the app. And the third part is, is, is discussion. So let's, let's crack on. Um, and um, the, the, the reminiscence study, as I said, had a relatively simple aim. It was to, the primary outcome measure was, was mutuality or other outcome measures. Um, but the app was, was to be developed and it was co-produced with people with dementia and their carers from the Reminiscence Network in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so, so far, so straightforward uh, in terms of the study. But um, as we were considering the design, because to, to develop this intervention, we had to develop an app. We decided on Apple operating system only. We procured the iPads um, and we uh, recruited the participants, so 30 dyads. Uh, and in designing the actual app itself, we realized we had an opportunity and we revised the ethics to include the, um, the event uh, data, so the usage data as people interacted with these, um, this digital intervention, this reminiscence app. So the 30 dyads were generating data that went up into the cloud and, um, and it was a fairly rudimentary setup. Um, and and we, we, we then developed that um, uh, as, as the study progressed. Um, and, you know, hey presto, from the study, from you know, 30 dyads, I think we had 29 in the end, there was a technical problem with one. Um, we were able to find information that we thought, well, this is quite interesting, isn't it? Um, um, if, if, you, if you think of uh, people sitting in a care home or living at home independently as these dyads where, um, uh, it would be very difficult, you know, unless you had a surveillance of them to ascertain their usage of um, a memory book, for example, at home. Um, but here we were getting really useful information. Um, the um, PWD is person with dementia, and we're seeing that the, the you know, the, the, the greatest number of actions, interactions across the dads was, was photographic um, reminiscence um, with, with people with dementia and, and followed closely by, by the cares, it must be noted, and that there was quite a lot of music reminiscence by um, people with dementia um, in contrast to uh, very little uh, for carers. Uh, anecdotally, we know from the focus groups that the carers are too busy looking after the people with dementia and so on. Um, and uh, But it was interesting also, we thought that video wouldn't really get much of a show in that it would just be photos, but we were pleasantly surprised to see that um, uh, video was 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 taken up and, and used. So th th this was useful. This was the results of um, the um, event log data, and this is just you know uh, descriptive statistics. 
This we find fascinating. This is a 24 hour uh, block. So we're looking at people's interactions over a 24 hour period for the 12 weeks, I should have said off the study, um, uh, that the, the diets had the, the, the iPads. And um, you can see that um, there's people with dementia reminiscing um, from midnight to three in the morning. Um, and it would have been almost impossible to ascertain that without this type of uh, digital intervention in the study. Um, we can also see that there's peaks and troughs, which correspond to, um, you know, postprandial reminiscence, uh, for want of a better term, and um, that that it, it it fades off then into the evening. So this was still very very interesting, but this was you know, pretty uh, straightforward um, uh, data analysis. We then, even for such a small um, um, study with with um, twenty nine. Diets. Um, we, whenever you look at the number of action, interactions that each dyad would generate, there was quite a lot of data. So we uh, used machine learning, in this case clustering, an unsupervised machine learning technique to identify um, different behavioral clusters, um, which we did. And I don't have time um, today to, to look into that in more detail, but it's in many of these slides you can see at the bottom, there's a, uh, the paper with, with uh, further detail and the, the DOI link. Um, and, and I'm sure that I don't mind these slides being, being circulated to the attendees. Um, so we were getting quite useful information. What we then did was label these clusters. So we, 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 we were looking at them from another lens. Here we can see the, the box plots. So there are five box plots here, uh, one for each variable that we used in the clustering. Um, so for example, we looked at the number, top left, number of uh, people with dementia interactions with the app, to the right of that, the number of care interactions with the app, and so on. So five different variables, and then the four clusters, remember these, uh, we, um, we, we looked at those through these variables. Uh, th through the perspective of these variables in the box plus. And we're able to see then that um, uh, cluster three, if we look at the, um, uh, the mean day interval between each unique day interaction, cluster three is, it's a bit like Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other, you know? So, so cluster three, when we look at it for this variable is very different, whereas the one at the top right, it's um, cluster four is very different. So that allows us to, um, um, to, to label the clusters, we're able to say, well, we think this, you know, there are three main clusters, typical user, well-supported, dependent user, dependent on the care, disengaged, irregular user, and then there was one cluster with just one, one diet in it. So someone who was using it, one, you know, could argue as addicted to it in the sense that they were using it and overusing it um, over the 12-week period. So this was, again, very, very powerful. Uh, feedback, which made us think, well, actually, if this was in the wild uh, as an app, this data, these data would, would and, and the insights from machine learning would, would be very valuable. We don't, you know, necessarily know who these people are. In the small study, we, we could track that down, but in the larger app development, we wanted to design that out. Um, then also, um, we had some interesting discussions about, um, well, if we can you know, have a digital app with event logging, capturing usage in real time. Um, shouldn't we, you know, ask questions while the person's using it, which are, um, you know, experience sampling or ecological monitor assessment. So these ecologically valid uh, questions and we selected um, the uh, 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 primary outcome scale. Um, as, as the basis and variations of that to ask. Um, so, so also we've shown as a side avenue that um, certain things like um, some of the uh, user experience assessment and user friendliness assessments that are used um, by systems designers require the participants to have a, a good recall, good memory recall. And, um, and people with dementia didn't suit that. So it was another reason to ask them questions as they were in the moment, uh, rather than, than, than uh, after the event. Um, so the mutuality scale questions that we asked and, and these um, 
within the curly braces, we 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 inserted the the partner's name and and so on. So it might say how attached are you uh, to Joseph and, and and so on and so forth. Um, so as well as as having the scales, the quant scales, primary outcome measure scales being asked um, at the start, mid, and end point of the twelve week period, and focus groups um, uh, as well in those periods, uh, we had the event logging, and then we had the uh, outcome scale questions being asked um, uh, as the people used the devices. Um, so that that was very interesting. It brought us up to something that we had never thought about before. Well, how do we how do we do that? Um, um, what kind of logic do we put in place um, that we can ask a question? Um, so, you know, you, 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 have to, you have to think this through and then engineer it into the system. And it's sometimes not that easy. So I think we've all experienced app usage where it asks you to recommend it or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, there, there's a, a pester angle here. You certainly don't want to be asked the, the question asked a, one of these questions, you know, at a frequency of one every minute for 10 minutes when you're trying to reminisce. Um, but it should be while you're reminiscing uh, and so on. So we, we, we had to think through a logic here and, and then later in the app. In the, uh, um, and, and then, of course, we, we then had this metadata about how people answered the EMA questions. Um, so we, we had an overall dismissal rate um, of 30%. So again, we were quite surprised here. Um, these were certainly not digital natives. They were using the app, um, usually on, you know, on the study on, on their lap, on an iPad. Um, yet when presented with a question, you know, 70% of the time overall, they, they answered it, um, which was you know, uh, reassuring. Um, these weren't resisting or abstaining from interactions at the, the, this cohort. Um, they, um, People living with dementia used the app more than the carers in the trial period, but had a lower dismissal rate uh, than the carers. So um, maybe it's just to do with the, 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 the disease. Um, uh, we, we don't know, um, but it, it, was, it, was, it was promising um, and, and, and useful, um, which gave us um, impetus to continue with this. Um, just some detail here on, on the left we're seeing the, uh, for carers and, and person with dementia, the the times that they were presented, and you know you've seen something similar to this earlier. So um, it's really a function of them using the app, and they use the app in between meals and so on, and more in daytime. And um, on on the right hand side, you see the uh, it sliced up week by week. Um, so um, useful, um, a good takeaway. From that. Um, so the design recommendations that, that we got from that, um, taking that forward, and we, we thought about these more broadly for digital apps, um, that we, we should co-produce those, you know, with, with users, um, and that um, we shouldn't engage in putting up these, in essence, kind of pop-up questions until after um, several weeks have gone past and the people had settled into using it. Um, don't don't present more than one per day. Um, and um, we, we knew when the dismissal rate was lowest when people were presented, and that was 8 p.m. in the evening for this app. So, you know, that's quite a good time. Um, um, so this gets us into the, I have a, a slide with a bullet point on it later, ethical gamification, you know, so is this ethical to do this? Um, and um, we, we can talk about that at the end of the discussion. Um, so and if the user's in the middle of doing something like uploading a Daniel O'Donnell video or whatever, uh, by breaking copyright, of course, then you know um, you shouldn't interrupt that with, with putting a question. It should just be when they're reminiscing. So that's us speeding into the, um, the second part of the presentation, which is um, after we... Um, presented our final report from the study, which was led by Professor Sumter Ryan, the uh, professor of nursing in Ulster University and a, an interdisciplinary team, including psychology, computing, nursing, and, and so on. And um, we were then funded by the Department of Health in Northern Ireland to um, 
to um, uh, procure the development of an app from a software company. And the resulting app, to cut a long story short, is, is the inspired app. This is your life, your story, your app. And if those are interested, they can go and, and look at that, that um, the web page for it, which is links to the app store for, for downloading it. And it has its own little Twitter account. Um, so this is now the um, moving on from the study. This is now the app. Um, the EMA questions we ask in the app, they're, they're in three types. The last one is, is about reminiscing. The, the middle one is um, how you feel. So we're quite interested really in, in the person's feeling when they're reminiscing. Um, and then the top one was, you know, how much are you enjoying reminiscing today? So those, those are the types of questions that we then present and with different frequency of presentation design for those and, and so on. So the you know, the, the, the learning that went into that was, was from the study and helped us an awful lot as to do the logic and so on. And this is what the app looks like, uh, photos, sounds, videos, and you can create albums. And here's one I did from my running around Northern Ireland last summer in the lockdown um, and, and in the West of Ireland as well. So you, you get an idea and then you can browse through your album. It doesn't have to be photographs. It can be video and um and uh, music, for example, and, and um, they can be mixed up. Um, so the data then that underpins all of this here, and this is made up data, but this this is the, the, the fields. These are the fields that are collected. So whenever people register to use the app, they, um, they're asked for their name and um, um, they're, they're asked for a contact email address. This is not for us as researchers, but this is for the app company so that it can send them market marketing information remind them about updates or whatever um, and then the the other kind of data that are recorded here we're seeing that uh, when people onboard onto the app there's a unique id given they're asked for their gender they don't have to give that they're asked for their age they don't have to give that and then they they um they set up as a person with dementia or a care so the app can cope with one person with dementia one care so arguably limited in that way. Um, and here you see the kind of log that then would be generated <clears throat> that you saw the, the, the graphics from earlier as a result of that. So this unique user is viewing a personal photo on this date and this time. And of course, if they're viewing another personal photo at that date, but 30 seconds later, we can analyze and, and find out that, well, they looked at this for 30 seconds. So you, you can derive information from the, the event log data and, and also EMA questions can be put up. And then the, um, the next table, the bottom table there is the question, the EMA questions presented <clears throat> and uh, the response, you know, whether they dismissed it or uh, added a great deal. So the, the architecture for this is quite, complex and difficult because we wanted to do it at a low cost way, but we wanted it to be um, um, certainly not prone to failure and, and, and um, uh, going uh, crashing and, and so on. We wanted it to be as um, uh, resilient to you know problems and, and so on. So the, um, the name and email data goes to a, a da different data store. Um, the event logs and the EMA data, all the other tables that you saw me walk through, go to a Google Firebase um, repository, which is then interfaced from Google BigQuery. And if it sounds complicated, it is, um, but it, it, it works. Um, and, um, and here, um, this is just hot off the press by one of my final year undergrad students where he has pulled the data out for six weeks of the in the wild app um, looking over the 24 hour period and you get the same kind of not much activity at night naturally and and um, uh, and then um, peaks and troughs to do with meal times uh, you know there's maybe 150 users making this up so um, it's it's early days yet but I just thought I'd give you a flavor and you know, there's what the, on the left-hand side, um, uh, there's, um, sorry, that's the wrong graph there with me, but you, you saw that the, uh, the information peaking and tracking before. <clears throat> so we now have the app out in the wild. We have um, Orca, um, which is a UK uh, company, um, private company that's been contracted by the NHS um, to verify apps, curate them, 
uh, to allow them into the digital um, uh, app library for the NHS. And um, people have different views on this, um, but it's worked for us. So we got a high score of 78 or whatever, which meant we were allowed into the library. Um, the Department of Health then is, has its own website portal where you can search for um, our apps um, and, and other apps that are available anyway. You don't have to go through here, but the idea is that a, a memory clinic um, um, a, a health professional can socially prescribe um, inspired using this and the, the email address of the care, for example. Um, so quite an interesting mode of usage there. So I've whizzed through that and, you know, I, I'm aware that um, Jane has graced me with another five minutes of, of um, six minutes of time. Um, and so moving on, and apologies if, if you feel if, if, if I have gone too fast or whatever. Um, but moving on to the discussion then. So this is what the um, schematic of what, what a, you know, the data that's being collected. So the user's interacting with an app. There's some back and forth there. The, the data is personal data, which is going to the app development company. The event log data and the EMA data is going up into the cloud. And then it's coming to us as a, the research organization. And then we're doing machine learning with it, and then we're going to publish papers and so on. And that's fine. If we look at a, another example, Talk Life is a curated um, online anonymous chat um, with hundreds of thousands of users worldwide. I was talking to the, um, the uh, creator uh, behind it uh, last week. Um, and if we look at it, it's, it, it's different, you know, you ignore it, it may not have, it, it has event log data, it has personal data, it has, you know, um, uh, chat data primarily, which all goes up into the cloud. And then the talk life itself, the app company have a different business model where they allow uh, organizations like Harvard or um, um, uh, University of, Car of, of Cardiff, for example, as research organizations to get access to that data, which is especially granted on request or not. And then the research organizations can, can uh, analyze that. So, you know, think about this or this, and, and these, are, these are quite odd. What would these look like if the NHS itself commissioned these? You know, would the data ever make it out to the research organizations. What about Babylon um, Health? Um, what would its diagram look like here? Um, uh, you know, here, you know, we're hoping that the data is democratized or respecting people's rights. We don't know who the people are. They can um, uh, consent to reveal their gender and age or not. Uh, but if we have that, we can put that into the machine learning. And our, our, our hope is that then that will you know, the research will, will help inform policy and practice for the NHS. Um, and, and, you know, one can think that that's what Google and Babylon are, are going to do, or one can think otherwise. Um, or, you know, you have um, um, Talk Life, which is more a variant of, of Inspired here, uh, which seems to, you know, help different number of research organizations to interact. So, so, so that's the architecture, that, that's where the data flows are going. Um, just some concept, concepts here, just to, you know, to, to put them out there. You know, we, we do know about things like data in the wild. So there are all kinds of data out there. Um, data in the wild is think, you know, Twitter data, or Facebook data, or, you know, people applying machine learning uh, image analysis algorithms to smiley faces on Instagram and working out people in Northern Ireland are happiest because they smile more than people from Norfolk or something like that. So it's kind of found data. And then there, there's real world data, uh, real world evidence, which is increasingly thought of as like um, electronic health record data. Um, uh, so it's not data that has been specifically designed in a study um, or to be collected in a study or whatever, but, but it's very valuable. Um, and we've mentioned EMA already. Um, dynamic consent generates um, lots of data. It would be very interesting to analyze um, um, the degree to which people choose to opt in or opt out of um, if they can and if it's easy to do. 
um, uh, of of up uh, of consenting for the data to be collected. Of course, it's a nightmare for for us as researchers because it, it means we may have to you know close off um, that user ID and not use it at all. But um, you know that, that that's you know, that, that's fine. Um, I mentioned ethical gamification is increasing growth in, in people talking about, especially in mental health apps for young people and so on, the gamification of the interaction to, you know, to engender uh, usage and and, um, um, and, and non-abandonment of the uh, interaction, the digital interaction. And um, I had a quick look um, last week when we were talking about this is a much work on so-called ethical gamification because there's lots of um, work out there and evil by design and the Headspace mental health app, you know, you can see a lot of material on the internet about people finding it hard to, to unsubscribe from the monthly um, payment or use of that app. Um, so there, there are good ways to do this and bad ways to do that and ethical dilemmas around all of that. And I've mentioned digital phenotyping as well. Uh, John Torres, of course, in, in Harvard talks um, uh, uh, very cogently about digital phenotyping and on the right you can see all the columns on the right relating to clinical disease and, and the use of uh, smartphone sensors and biosensors and EEG and so on but if we come back to more today and, and look at the left hand side we can see that with smartphones we with all of the devices like GPS accelerometers and heart rate skin conductance and so on we can get a lot of um, a lot of data um, which we can you know can then help to uh, present a phenotype in, in digital form of, of that person's behavior um, so so there's lots of research in this I don't know if it's going to make it out of the, the the domain of psychiatry or if it's going to be taken up as a, as a term um, in, in the recent paper that, that I uh, uh, published with others on, on ethical issues we were looking at some of the sensors within this and, and where the the ethical concerns were, um, 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 you know, from the accelerometers to the, the call logs and, and camera and, and, and so on. And sometimes they're not where you think they are, the ethical concerns. Um, um, I, you know, I, I've seen uh, data collected from young people with uh, autism and and their, um, their, their movement, uh, GPS movement, is characteristically different from other people's, um, so, and and one one wouldn't have thought that a prior prior to the um, um, an ethical approval or an ethical application for a study or whatever. So there there are all kinds of um, very interesting um, facets of um, interaction that can be caught by these sensors that that are in your phone and indeed by the in, you know the, the um, uh, cross analysis of, of data from from different ones by bringing them together and I'm just going to finish up with a, a, um, a patent award that I saw was awarded I think very recently for Spotify um, which was talking about the identification of taste attributes from an audio signal so if you're talking to your smart speaker and you want you know um, Nana Muscuri to be played or whatever, and you ask for that, and um, um, that Spotify is is hoping to capture your emotion in your voice, and you know your intonation, and other prosodic components, um, as well as you know your age, gender, accent, and so on. And and here you see some markup code of what it would look like from their actual patent application. So you know we're we're, we're talking about going much further than the Inspired app is doing. Uh, in terms of the data, and here we're seeing you know, one of the big platforms, and I think this is the way it is going to go. That um, you know, um, secondary data that we're not aware of is um, is going to be of tremendous value to these platforms, and and um, you know, um, and also what if you know what if it determines that the emotion is despair, uh, and it's point nine. Um, you know, should it do something about that? Um, so um, some of the points then that relate to data and digital health, we're not going to have, um, and most of my work here is in mental health services and digital mental health services and thinking about blending of services. So we need to work out how, how we work with face-to-face -face services and digital and the blending of those in the data from those. And COVID has been 
you know, um, very interesting because we're seeing a lot of organizations such as in Northern Ireland um, offering counseling services and all moving 100% online um, um, and offering the opportunity for better data and insights and so on and management of the service, but, but uh, issues as well. We, you know, we can use, um, if we have these data, we, we can have optimization of waiting lists. So if people are waiting for face-to-face, -face, they may be offered a digital service, which, you know, is, is there a two-tier um, uh, uh, society and these kind of uh, offerings down the line? Who owns the data? I personally feel that, you know, if you generate it, you should have a right to um, to, to have some say about it and so on, but uh, I don't want to go there. Um, uh, the access to it by healthcare professionals is a minefield as well. So if you have a heart attack, um, someone who's a paramedic should maybe be able to access your electronic health record. Um, but if your G does should your GP know all kinds of information, maybe divulge to um, in confidence to someone in, in a mental health, another mental health service and so on. Also, how do we manage safety going back to the point about detecting, you know, despair at point nine or whatever? Um, and, and it's not that easy. We've seen that Wobot and other chatbots have messed up there where they haven't really signposted people to safety. And then finally here, the, the issue of digital exclusion that, um, you know, um, it may be that poverty forces people away from the, these portals and access to them in a way. And we've seen some of that um, through COVID and some of the, the, the talk about it. So in summary, we're seeing more AI, more machine learning. Um, we're seeing national health organizations. I mean, the NHS contracted ORCA. We're seeing this all around the world. Um, you know, in a way, it's many private organizations are, are, are making hay in, in this area as well. Um, but people like it as well. People like apps, like self-management, um, and uh, you know they like their Strava telling them certain things. They like um, their Headspace telling them certain things, and so on. And, and that helps them reflect and have insights. Um, so you know it's more or less a good thing. Logging user interactions is maybe an incredibly naive statement. Does allow for greater insights into their needs. Um, and you know I always thought that you know it shouldn't just be. You know, Amazon doing personalization, it should be the NHS, you know, doing it in an ethical way. Um, but how do we do that? The risks are, are very difficult. And um, I think, you know, the, the you know, the public uh, health services, um, you know, I think on balance can be argued that they benefit. So there's, you know, it's a, a lower cost way for data to be gathered, and and um, and we know that you know healthcare is very expensive, um, and it can allow new ways for digital epidemiological analyses and provide data to inform health policies. I think that's broken at the minute, um, or everything's taken on a on a one off basis. Um, just looking at the COVID app usage data, it's not really that democratically available. Um, public health organizations can and do promote health apps. We know that inspired an example. And you know, digital phenotyping analysis does offer benefits and it can be taken up by these organizations. However, we do need clear guidelines and the difficulty really is, and I'd love to hear um, questions and answers from you this evening. The difficulty is um, you know, the ownership of the data uh, secondary data, anonymous data, anonymized data, and information derived from these data. How can it and should it be used? So thank you very much. And apologies for taking so long. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. That was a fantastic talk. And I think it just uh, sent my brain whirling in terms of kind of the questions that um, uh, people must have for you and that I have. Um, could we go back to uh, the view of um, all of our audience? Um, I, I was particularly interested and um, please, please put um, your hand up or put your um, questions in, in the chat. Um, so, I just had a question for you, and it was really about um, this relationship um, around data and data ownership, and the fact that you you went 
you're a professor of computer science, but you still go and get a company to develop an app because obviously that's the way that you get, you know, enterprise ready um, app that lots of people can use. But it's this relationship between researchers, a national health services, a service and companies and the fact that you do need to go to companies. And while you have a very ethical framework in terms of how, which data goes where, um, we know that actually all of the apps that we use, and I feel as if I've got hundreds on my phone, um, have different basic service agreements. And, and so we, we really do have to manage that relationship, don't we? Um, but I was just wondering, you know, what do you think as um, someone who's involved, what, what would be the ideal way to it? Obviously, obviously we have, um, you know, uh, OCA, but are there other, other organise, sorry, ORCA, other organisations that actually um, might be able to do that back-end work? Um. Yeah, I think the state of the art is is your own work on dynamic consent, Jane. Um, and and I'm not just saying that. Um, I, oh yeah, I mean we we didn't we didn't all we didn't uh, rehearse this in any way. <laughs> no, 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 we didn't. Um, Orca is is very interesting, but it seems to be um, it's doing good stuff. So it says that you shouldn't um, that the app has to be usable, that it has to have its. Um, uh, data use policies defined in, in a certain way and so on. Um, but it does allow an app, for example, uh, designed for people with dementia to have in-app purchases, which seems to me to be rather um, strange, one could argue. Um, um, and um, it, it, in terms of, the, it's more the usability than the, the, the consenting and the um, um, educating the user to the use of the data arising from them consenting. We all know that you download an app and you may, you just, you know, some, some of the consenting may make you scroll down to the bottom before you accept. Um, some of them allow you to get it to be emailed to you. So some of them make it easy for you to, you know, to check out offline, but most of them don't. And you never really pay attention to them as evidenced by the fact that most people who use Facebook have agreed to a uh, perpetual license where Facebook doesn't own your data, but it's got a perpetual license to, um, to make use of it um, and to use it for whatever purposes it likes uh, um, in perpetuity. Um, so I think one could argue that um, the, the, the users aren't educated enough and that's always a dangerous thing to, to assert that they, they need better digital literacy skills um, or they need better you know data consent implication skills or, or whatever but I would turn that around and I would say that the the orcas and so on should be placing the field more strongly in terms of um, policy but what's lagging is that policy um, and it's very hard to set out a, an overarching policy that caters for every kind of app and, and so on. But one would have hoped that the NHS X, for example, would have shown leadership in setting out the case and then ORCA, you know, follow suit in, in the implementation of it. Um, but I'm worried that we won't get anything that uh, works and that some of the big um, internet multinational platforms uh, and big multinational healthcare organizations um, that, you know, any organization with a profit motive uh, is going to have a very different perspective from the perspective that I've just outlined with Inspired. Thank you very much. Um, so please put your hand up if you would like to um, ask a question. Um, Justine, you had your hand up. Yeah, I did. Thanks. Thanks so much for such an interesting talk. Um, I actually wanted to ask you about the NHS's approval of your app. Um, so I understand that your app is offered by the NHS store and for that to happen, the NHS had to, you had to submit your app to the NHS and it had to approve it. So I, I guess I had two questions about that. Firstly, how important was, was you know, that process of having the NHS approve your app so that it could be offered via the store to you? 
And also, what were the, you know, what, what did the process entail? What were the criteria that were applied by the NHS? And yeah, I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that worked. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> so um, it isn't the NHS, it's ORCA are doing it on behalf of the NHS. Um, and we thought it was incredibly important that this was done um, and we followed the, the, the procedures because, you know, we had been uh, granted public money to develop the study. Um, and then an outcome of the study was this further funding to allow us to develop the app. So it would have been churlish of us to then um, uh, say, well, you know, we're not really interested in doing that. So we we had a moral duty, uh, if you like, to, um, to, to, you know, to make sure that the NHS app um, was, was um, uh, the NHS app store was where our app would, would be. Technically, we didn't need to do that. We could just go into the uh, Android and, and Apple uh, stores. Um, but, you know, clearly we, we, we think it's so important. And the, the area, we th the reason that the operational reason we think is so important is we really like this idea of socially prescribing um, a non-pharmacological intervention, in this case, the Inspired app, so that people would go to a memory clinic and the care would, would, would you know, would, could be asked for that, would be asked for their email and would ask if they want to consent to download the app. Um, so it would result in an email to them and then they would uh, click on a link and it would uh, the equivalent of going to the apps, any of the app stores, but it would mean that there was information about the number of social prescriptions being generated by the health service in Northern Ireland um, for this app. And there are a few other apps. There's a clear app uh, as well, developed by the Northern Health and Social Care Trust in Northern Ireland and others to follow. So there, you know, the, but this is really early days. This is the green shoots of the NHS in Northern Ireland trying to have, it's not really a walled garden, it's, it's, just, it's just a separate little garden from the two other big gardens, which are the two app stores. Uh, but it will be interesting down the line to see the degree to which it's used and the degree to which the, the other app stores are used. And of course, you don't need to live in Northern Ireland to access any of those three app stores, but we have about 16,000 people in Northern Ireland living with dementia. So we're very interested to see the uptake in Northern Ireland. One of the other um, data points that we gather if it's switched on by the users is the uh, city um of um uh, that, that they're living in so we, we do get information about that but that's it we don't get postcode or street or you know northings and eastings or latitude and, and longitude and to answer your question about um, orca and its criteria they're, they're quite detailed and if you visit orca.co.uk you know you can have a quick browse through them um they do charge so so, so it is a business model they do charge the companies developing the app um, to, to go through the process. It's not very expensive, it's a few hundred pounds. Um, it's mostly on usability, um, UX, as it's known, user experience. And then the second big area is um, compliance with GDPR, um, compliance with accessibility guidelines, um, and which is the easiest one because most of the Apple and Android uh, development environments support, you know, high contrast screens and changing text size and, and, and so on. But th that's what it's mostly about. In terms of the data side, that's probably the least mature angle. Um, it's interesting to note that there's also an ISO standard, which seems to have been developed from um, the Netherlands at the moment, um, which again is, is on um, health app development and the user friendliness of them. So this seems to be something that's been picked up, not just by Orca, um, which is, you know, th these apps do have to be friendly and easy to use. But at the end of the day, I think um, the, the pathways for the data usage and declarations about the usage um, are most important. Incidentally, I think we've hit a bump in the road with Apple at the moment. Last week, they switched on in the new variant of their operating system, um, um, a do not track option, um, which you know is a very good thing. So you can say, well, I do not want Facebook to be able to track me through my mobile phone um, and um, for, for advertising, for advert, you know, to sell on to advertisers. However, I think we've been caught up in that. So Apple are telling us that we have to comply with this tracking new tracking rule, even though we're not an advertiser and we are gathering the data for research purposes. But uh, I just heard that this afternoon, so I don't don't have a, a 
was all done. It's just yeah. Mm. Oh, that uh, that could have quite an effect, couldn't it? I mean, I, it's interesting that there isn't, there aren't the distinctions not being made for different purposes. So something comes in and it applies to everybody, which actually could be quite detrimental, as you say, for you. Um, are there any other questions from the floor? Any questions? So um, I, I will then continue a conversation with you. Um, uh, one of the things that I thought was um, quite interesting was how much this data actually could tell you about people. So all of the metadata, and I was thinking particularly when you were talking about um, when people were using the app, but also the fact that um, there are different types of movement and use of a phone for um, people with autism, for instance. And, and this whole movement to being able to use all of these indicators, um, which are part of the digital phenotype, to actually give insights that could have a clinical application, but also could have a commercial application. And I think I, I, we do know that people are, are desperately concerned about how their data is used by commercial bodies. But the fact that this digital data is starting to be recognized as having great value and really to put us in a position where um, other people know more about us than we know about ourselves. And so I was just wondering if, if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I do. Um, and, uh, and they're mostly centered around my concern, you know, the moment looking at that Spotify patent. Um, yeah. Um, because, you know, the vast majority of people in five years time using Spotify, assuming it's still around, will, will probably you know, know nothing about the, the power and computational, in, you know, the insights of computational machine learning and so on can give if they're gathering that kind of data longitudinally um, and the implications that has. Um, uh, so so it, it does concern me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about the, the apples do not track and, and your dynamic consent and and maybe putting, if you put something like those two together so that regardless of the app, you can say what you allow to be tracked about you. Um, and um, so you could say, well, yeah, you can know my gender and my age. I, I will consent for that to be gathered together with accelerometry data while the app is being used. Um, and, and nothing else is allowed to go out. Um, so that would seem to me to be a reasonable thing. It seems to be in a line with where apps like, or app companies and, and software companies like Apple are going, and it brings on board the dynamic consent uh, idea. And it's already an idea that apps are comfortable with, you know, the idea of, you know, gather this data only when I'm using the app, you know, so only use my geographic location when I'm using Google Maps for navigation, for example. Um, so all the component bit, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> all the components are there to allow, <coughs> excuse me, to allow um, um, an app level, <coughs> an app level analysis and, and switch off of different components. Um, so, so maybe if the apps have to declare what data they want to pull off the device, um, they have to put it in front of the user and the user can consent or not to any and all of those at any one time. I can't see why that would be difficult to engineer. Yes, I, I, and, and I think what you're pointing to is that there's more of a move to a granular consent, but we haven't got the communication interfaces. So that that isn't very, you know, the onward use of data is not transparent or we're, we're just told what companies have access to our data, but we don't know for mm. what purposes or what kind of data that is. Yeah, um, not, yeah. 
that's the other side of it, I guess, you know, and we know the travails that people have when they seek to get their data from Facebook and Facebook gives them a data dump and it's, it's nothing about all the other information that they have. Um, so we know that the, the platforms are, are guarding access to the behavioral and, uh, and event data and, and inferred data and secondary data and, and so on and so forth, because it is their crown jewels. Um, yeah. Maybe there'll be a WikiLeaks equivalent for some of the big social media platforms that will, will, will transform society, maybe not. But I, but I think the fine grained switching, um, opting in out um, and um, and making that easy to use and dynamic and ubiquitous in both main platforms um, together with um, <clears throat> strong government led um, uh, rules about <clears throat> access to what, you know, what this organization holds on, on you as an individual. Um, and, and I guess it's about leadership, you know, around the world at government level that then um, um, you know, because it, it can never be done by you know a pan pan um, government uh, consensus or whatever that would just be lobbied, arguably, um, by by uh, people with deep pockets. Thank you. So uh, we've got some questions coming through on the chat uh, on the chat, um, and so uh, one of the questions was: um, Are you aware of organisations similar to Orca acting outside the UK? internationally, i.e. Latin America, for digital solutions within the healthcare sector? Yeah, thanks, Sharmila. Um, no is a short answer, but I have a slide deck from John Torres where he mentions two other equivalents to ORCA. Um, and um, I can't recall either of them right now, but if you drop me an email, I will uh, dig out that slide and, and send it back to you or send the whole deck back. Uh, Shamila, happy to do that. I'm sorry my memory is failing. It wasn't Latin America, it was more US. Mm. Yes, and of course what um, uh, Miranda Morby has pointed out is that we've got the European Health Data Space which is really um, coming into its own. Um, I, we're not quite sure how um, the UK will relate to that. But that the intention there is uh, to really have a repository of data that can be used for a range of social purposes. And it will be very interesting to see what the, um, the data uh, pathways are with that. And as you pointed out, the ownership over the data, who has access um, to the data and how much citizens are told about the use of that data. Um, and, and so there is a, a joint um, uh, member state action which will be looking at those issues around the European health data space. Um, but I'm not sure how much they're actually looking at uh, the regulatory aspects. I know that they're doing quite a lot on um, citizens' perspectives. So uh, Shamilia's um, question is also very relevant for the European data health space, European health data space even. Yeah. Um, and, and, but, 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 but so much of the data that, that is generated on our devices and our sensors and our smartphones is, is not specifically health. Um, um, you know, so I've seen a lot of um, discussions about um, 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 electronic health record perspectives and a lot of the providers of these solutions, you know, obviously they're interested in selling more of those and everything's couched in the terms of uh, an electronic health record. Um, and, 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 and that's, I don't think that's it. Um, uh, so we need something that's, that, that manages to square the circle of catering for the user's data, whatever that those data are, with, you know, whatever the health provider that you pay your taxes to support, you know, should store uh, relating to your health. Um, so I'm just looking at the European health data space. It's very interesting. Um, but I think I'd heard of it before, but, um, uh, but not more recently. I think Brexit made me not look at these things for a while. 
it's the same for all of us really, isn't it? Um, I think what's interesting also when we think about, you know, there's been so much work put into how we can analyze what's written in, um, you know, electronic medical records and, and how do we take those paper records and those squiggles by doctors and turn them into something that we can actually understand. But really when you think about it, it's, it's more of the, um, the, the apps, it's the devices that are, you know, it's our smartphones that are actually more indicative of our health status than what, go, what we present to um, healthcare professionals, because that's usually that's when we're experiencing um, disease. So we've already got symptoms rather than um, being more of a preventative um, space and so I think you know it's I think we're sort of going through quite a lot of transitions in terms of health and um, and what's happening um, thank you Mimi did you have a question sorry I think my chat was covering your hi um, <laughs> thank you so much um, it's a great talk um, I have one more question about um, consent um, thinking mostly about our end user here who are patients or people with dementia. So if consent um, is not only to a normal adult who is uh, interested in um, downloading an app or buying something from a website, let me put it into context. If um, I'm caring for my um, father, for example, um, if he has early dementia, and uh, downloaded your app. And then two years down the line, I decided that, well, he was forgetting a lot of things. Um, he, I didn't even know that he downloaded um, the Inspired app and I wanted him to stop, um, stop paying for the subscription, et cetera. Does the legal framework or this kind of terms and condition in the app allow someone to step in um, to stop this consent? Because the, basically our consumer are, are quite different from anyone else who are using apps. Um, but these people are kind of maybe mentally um, incapacitated. Yeah, well, we do have the Mental Capacity Act um, and, and it's a really interesting area. I think it's quite a difficult area. Um, um, Occam's Razor would, would just say that, you know, um, um, you know, it's, it, you know, it, the consent can be withdrawn on behalf of um, the, the, the person living with dementia. It's, it's, it's beneficial to them, um, but I appreciate it's difficult. Um, um, it's difficult in real life, and it's not going to be any easier in the digital world, I would think. Well, I think, um, thank you very much, uh, Morris. Thank you to everyone for your questions. I just want to give you a virtual clap. So I'll clap and say thank you very much um, for your presentation um, and a very stimulating seminar. Um, everybody else is clapping. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. You're all very kind. Uh, um, and uh, we have our next seminar, which I think is, uh, Imogen, when is that? Is two weeks time two weeks time same time but in two weeks time yeah so um thank you very much for coming um and we look forward to seeing you at our next seminar thank you very much for the